Good evening from Charlotte. It is June the 17th, 2020. I'm James Brierton. Did you get a chance to see the sun today at all? Maybe kind of sort of. We have been cut off from the rest of the world. No, I'm not talking coronavirus. I'm talking about this low pressure that is just parked over the Carolinas today. It's very pretty on this satellite image that uh, our friend Brad Penovich captured. You can see it there just spinning. Out over like Fayetteville, Fort Bragg, between Charlotte and Raleigh, just spinning and spinning and spinning, but that just socked us in with clouds. I did see just a little bit of sun today here in Charlotte before the uh, sun went down, and that was a nice uh, change of pace after a couple days of cloudy and cold weather. All right, this week we are talking the PGA Tour, which has resumed and is in Hilton Head, South Carolina, for the RBC Heritage. It kicks off tomorrow after a couple of practice rounds. I'm holding here the weather forecast from their on-site meteorologist, Stuart Williams. This is what we call a tease. I'll have this for you coming up. What we're going to get to first is a piece of tape that has been very patiently waiting in the wings. So Stewart sat down with the Carolina Weather Group in February to record an interview that at the time we thought was going to air alongside the Wells Fargo Championship here in Charlotte. Well, as you now know, that never happened. And other PGA Tour events were canceled. They are now resuming operations without fans and will be playing in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So we are very excited to be able to bring this piece of tape to you. This is a premiere of a new episode. You've never seen this interview before, despite the fact that it was recorded in February. But I felt that I needed to explain to you that it was recorded in a time where I could still get a haircut and where the picture of snow over Scotty Powell's shoulder made sense. And all the references to fans attending the event also made sense back just a few months ago. So without further ado, we'll get on over to this. And then coming up uh, later on in the program, about 30 minutes from now, we'll get a check of your weather headlines this week, including that uh, PGA Tour forecast, uh, an update on Sharpie Gate, and we'll take a look at the tropics as well, too. But uh, without further ado, here is our interview with Stuart Williams, the on-site meteorologist for the PGA Tour, and he'll tell us a little bit about the company he works for as well. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. We're happy to have you this evening. And we present uh, Mr. Stuart Williams, meteorologist for the PGA Tour, which is a really cool job that I would love to have. Uh, as a big golf fan, uh, I think it's a really uh, unique job that Stuart has. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about that tonight and uh, let us know what all his duties are as he travels across the PGA Tour. And uh, we'd love for you to interact with us tonight, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them on the social media platforms, and we'll address those, and we'll let Stuart give out some of his social media information uh, towards the end of the interview tonight. That way, if you want to follow him on Twitter, uh, you can do that, or just get more information. So uh, we appreciate having Stuart with us tonight. Stuart, uh, welcome back to the show. I know we had you on a couple of years ago, fellow uh, North Carolinian, and uh, yeah. it, it's great to have you with us tonight. Uh, glad to see that you're actually home and not out on the road right now. So uh, for those who um, may be introduced uh, to you uh, for the first time, tell us a little bit about you. I know uh, you live here in North Carolina. You went to school here in North Carolina, so kind of give us a brief uh, background about who you are. Yeah, I, um, uh, I grew up in Winston-Salem. I currently live in High Point, North Carolina. And uh, I got my meteorology degree from UNC Asheville. So I was actually there from 1988 to 92. So that kind of dates myself there. So 50 years old now, so I'm getting older. But uh, yeah, so I, after that, I, um, started, uh, I started working for a company called Mobile Weather. And we started doing golf tournaments, uh, weather for golf tournaments. So it started like with the Crosby Celebrity Tournament there in Winston and the Vantage Championship, which was a Champions Tour event in Winston, and after that, after that was that was a nineteen that was I was interning then at that time when we started those probably about uh, ninety one or so, and then uh, as I graduated, uh, we kind of formed a company called Mobile Weather, and we started doing more and more golf tournaments. So individual tournaments would hire us, and then from there in nineteen ninety five we signed a full-time contract with the PGA Tour doing all their events. So, and it just kept snowballing from there. And then, so that I was working with a company then called Mobile Weather. And so we were doing golf tournaments. I was traveling all over the country. And then in 2005, I uh, started working for DTN. And uh, ever since then, I've been with DTN and 
we just keep growing and doing more and more events. So, you know, we have uh, all the PGA Tour, Champions Tour, Corn Ferry Tour. We do the LPGA. We do uh, the PGA of America, which includes the PGA Championship, Ryder Cup, Senior PGA, and some of their smaller events. And we do uh, quite a few uh, international events for uh, IMG. We do a lot of Asian tour tournaments in uh, China and Taiwan and that kind of thing. So, you know, we do over 150 events a year now. So it's, it's quite busy. Well, sort of, I know you're not the only one. I mean, that's, uh, that's a lot of traveling. So yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about your team. How many meteorologists do you guys have? Is it just you that goes out to uh, a tournament or is there kind of a team aspect for you guys? Yeah. Uh, how's that going? Yeah, we, we've got, uh, you know, we've got seven or eight guys that travel all the time. And you know, we usually just send one, one person to each tournament or event that we cover, you know, cause we do also do outdoor concerts and, uh, we do some, uh, other events like that, that we, uh, have a meteorologist go to and that, 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 uh, help out. But, uh, you know, there's one, one, one guy per tournament. And so basically, you know, on the PGA tour or any golf tournament or any outdoor we event with that we do lightning is the number one concern. So that's why a meteorologist is on site. We set up an electric field mill. We have two laptop computers that have obviously the, the Doppler radar, um, lightning detection. You know, we, we have a mix of Vaisla's national lightning detection network. And, um, you know, and so, um, all that data that we get in-house, we have, you know, all the computer models that we look at, the NAM, the Euro, the GFS, all those. So everything's in-house and we sector where we're gonna go and we, we can make custom products for ourselves and that kind of thing. So we make our own forecast on site. Um, so using all that technology as an official comes in, wondering what the weather is. If we do see a threat, we see a storm developing the officials can come in, we can show them exactly on the screen what is happening. And based on what we're showing them and what our opinions are, what's going to happen, then the officials can make very good decisions of, okay, when do we need to stop? And then once we do that, especially on the PGA tour, they have led boards across the golf course. They'll put weather warning signs up. The officials will blow horns to the players signaling, signaling that it's a dangerous situation. So then the players will get, moved off to uh, evacuation vans and cars and that kind of thing. And they're brought to the clubhouse. And so hopefully if we do our job correctly, then we've, give, we've given enough time to where people can get back to the buses and hopefully back to their cars. Cause not everybody has a clubhouse pass, so they can't all get indoors to, to safety. So we got to get a lot of them back to their car. So um, it's a big machine. It's a big operation, but it's, um, most tournaments, I'd say every tournament has an evacuation plan, emergency plan. So it works pretty well. And then the big question is, once we have stopped play, when do we go back and start playing? When is it safe to go back out? So that's what we help big time as far as, okay, we think this storm is going to be out of here at such and such time. And then they can open up the practice facilities again, let the players warm back up, and then we'll get them back out to the golf course and start playing again. Stuart, um, that kind of rings a bell here in Charleston at Bulls Bay, the, the tournament last year, LPGA, lightning yep. the tree, someone was standing, went under the tree, and you know, it's, it's a serious situation with these thunderstorms and in these golf tournaments. Um, how much collaboration do you guys have with the local National Weather Service, for, especially in big events like this? In the last few years, there's been a little bit more collaboration because, uh, you know, with uh, Homeland Security and a lot of these big uh, – you know, uh, government agencies and everything. A lot of a lot of these agencies are using golf tournaments as their training grounds for big events and and things like that. So I know down at the uh, RBC Heritage um, down in Hilton Head, you know, the uh, FBI shows up and and all the government agencies, the Weather Service, and so they do a lot of uh, practice at these uh, at that event since it's such a large event and so I do coordinate with the weather service there we'll, we'll talk what we're thinking you know and um, kind of bounce off ideas off each other but for the most part um, I'll maybe read a, a, a forecast discussion or something like that from the weather service but you know like I said having everything in-house all of our own computer models and that kind of thing I, you know we basically 
do our own thing, to be honest with you, make our own forecast. Um, Cause I think in a lot of ways, sometimes we do a better job cause we know what golf wants and we know what golf needs. So we know what they're looking for as far as a forecast goes. Whereas the weather service, they may be a little more general because they have a bigger area to cover. So, so for example, for us, wind forecasts are very big in, at the golf tournaments because that plays a huge role on how the golf course is going to be set up each day. So we concentrate a lot on wind. And, um, and so we try to be very accurate in that department where you may see a weather forecast from the weather service that says winds are five to 10. Well, okay, that's kind of general. We try to be more exact than that where our forecast will say maybe, uh, maybe we have a westerly wind like on the coast there. Maybe you have a, a, a drainage wind in the morning off the, off the land and then we'll get the sea breeze at one o'clock and it's gonna shift out of the south or south, southeast or whatever. And it's going to be 10 to 15 at that point. A lot of times the weather service really doesn't break it down like that. So, you know, we try to be more specific of what's going to happen at the golf course so they can plan how they're going to set the golf course up. So that, that's some of the things that uh, I think we do a better job at than, than TV or, or weather service being more general. Um, Stuart, let, let's, let's play, uh, let, let's hope we're not forecasting too far in the future. We have a Wells Fargo championship coming up in Charlotte, uh, the Wyndham championship in Greensboro. Let's say that you, uh, you're there forecasting and you see, uh, it could be a potential stormy day, you know, that there's going to be thunderstorms, uh, moving into the area. What, what is it? Kind of give us, uh, what you do the morning of, kind of give us a, a play by play of what that setup looks like. If, if you see, uh, you know, it's going to be a stormy afternoon or something in, in these tournaments. Well, let's say the first tee time is 7 a.m., okay? That's usually when most tournaments start, 7, seven in the morning. And um, I'm usually there probably about 5.30 in the morning because I'm looking at weather data, looking at the latest stuff, making my forecasts and getting that out and distributed, uploaded to the player page, that kind of thing. And so – we also have radios that we communicate to the officials with. So every morning I'll go into the rules office and tell the guys as they head out to set the golf course up, what I think the winds are going to be that day. And then what time I think the best chances of us getting a thunderstorm. And so if you take a North Carolina tournament, typically what happens is, as you know, as you'll know, Scotty, and they'll start in the mountains, they'll bubble up in the mountains about midday, early afternoon. And then, as they get going, they'll roll off into the Piedmont, and then they'll usually make it to Greensboro or Charlotte by 3, 4, or 5 in the afternoon, depending on how fast they move and what the scenario is. So, you know, so I'll tell the officials that morning, hey, I think we're going to see storms probably anywhere from that 3 to 7 range. And then that'll give them an idea when they need to start uh, paying attention, you know, so to speak. So, as we go through the morning there, I'll keep looking at the new data, see if there's anything we need to update. And then obviously I keep watching the screens. I'll have the radars going and that kind of thing. And then as soon as I see something that has a potential of getting to us, that's when I'll get on the radio and tell the officials, hey, uh, I'm seeing some uh, thunderstorms over, let's say, Yadkinville, and they're going to be moving across Winston and the Greensboro here in the next hour, hour and a half. So that'll give them the heads up that, hey, I'm starting to see some stuff that could impact us here in the next hour or two. And so that's when we'll start putting on the LED boards. There's a weather policy that runs and things that say, hey, inclement weather is possible, you know, please pay attention, that kind of thing. And then as the storm keeps moving closer, then I keep updating the officials. And then when I think is within, you know, less than an hour, um, usually the head rules official, which would be uh, Mark Russell or Slugger Wyatt, who are in charge of the competition, basically, they'll come into my office. I show them exactly what's happening. And then we try to give at least 30 minutes notice before the storm's going to hit the golf course so that we can blow the horns and give enough time for people to start trickling out and get the players in. And then obviously, as the storm gets closer, um, hopefully we've gotten everybody off the golf course and then the storm will hit 
And then, like I said, then we have the conversations. When do you think it's going to be out of here? When is it safe to resume? And so they'll already make, start making the plans on when that gets out of there, when we're going to let them to go back out and warm up on the range and then get them back out on the golf course. So, you know, it's kind of a lengthy process. But uh, I, as with weather, you know, you guys, we have uh, thunderstorms that pop up, can pop up right on top of you. So that's why we also have an electric field mill that we set up on site that measures the electrical charge. And so if we're seeing something develop real close to us, hasn't produced lightning yet, and we're wondering, is it going to, that electric field mill gives us the heads up that, hey, charges are building. And also looking on the radar, you look at the cloud tops, you kind of know what those cloud tops keep growing and you know what the freezing level is. And when it gets a certain height above that freezing level, that's when you start seeing the lightning. So using all those things together, you know, if I that, using all those things together, we can get a good idea that, hey, this cell will probably going to produce lightning. So that, that electric field mill is crucial in that aspect. So it may give us 10 or 15 minutes that we wouldn't have had if you waited for the first lightning bolt to come out. So, you know, we may only have 10 or 15 minutes to get them off, but that's still better than having no warning and all of a sudden there's a lightning bolt. So, yeah, technology plays a huge role in what we do. That's pretty fascinating. I didn't realize that much went into it. That's uh, that's pretty sophisticated and, and really good coverage on your part. Stuart, once y'all blow the horn, this is kind of going back a few minutes, yeah. but once y'all blow the horn to warn there's a you know, tornado or tornado one storm or even a severe thunderstorm uh, on its way, the players, um, they, you know, they're coming off the course, but for bystanders that are standing alongside the course um, or even in the stands, is there a safe place for them to go? Um, unless you have a clubhouse pass and generally no. Hmm. So, um, you know, if, if you're having a severe weather event, obviously you don't want to keep them in the tents and the sky boxes because right. you know, those are temporary structures and, and big lightning rods as well, just, you know, with, with the poles and everything. So, you know, we try to get people to go back to their cars, go back to the buses, get back to their cars. But, you know, it doesn't always happen that way. There's always stragglers. There's people that try to hide and wait it out and, because, uh, you know, as soon as we start back play, then they can run out and get a good spot on 18 or whatever. And, and, and they're in a good spot to get a good position to watch golf again. But, um, I mean, it happens. I mean, you know, we put weather warning signs up. We, we do the best we can. The tour, PGA Tour and all these events try to do the best they can to get people to leave. But, you know, there's always a few stragglers that always try to stand under a tree. And, you know, it's not recommended. But. It definitely, uh, it happens. No, I was just going to say that I, I'm sure that's a problem at a lot of these uh, outdoor sporting events, um, whether it be uh, air shows, I would imagine, um, have a big problem with that, or even like you mentioned earlier, uh, concerts. Uh, I think it was just last year uh, we saw some video went viral of a concert tent just taking off um, and uh, downdraft uh, outflow wind of a, of a tornado, uh, hurt, thunderstorm. That's my brain. Um, so, yeah, that, that seems like a real problem. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of outdoor festivals and concerts and stuff that don't have a meteorologist and the people in charge really don't know weather. So I think that's when you have more of the mistakes made or decision-making, not poor decision-making when those things happen. So, you know, fortunately for us and the comp my company I work for, you know, DTN, uh, we do a lot of consultation um, we have a lot of customers that call in and get a pin, opinion from a meteorologist. So I think uh, it's getting better and better as far as people hiring meteorologists or at least weather companies to help them out and make good decisions. And, and, and like for me on the on-site business, actually have a meteorologist at, at your site is, it's expensive. Um, you got to pay for hotel rooms and airline tickets and ship equipment and, and, uh, you know, plus have the meteorologist there. So that's kind of a hard thing for some organizations to pay that kind of money to have somebody there. But once you have that meteorologist there that's on site, they see how it works and how it makes takes the pressure off them making these decisions. And it actually pays for itself, to be honest with you, to make good decisions. But, you know, like I said, if, if you don't have the money, a lot of these organizations just don't have the budget for it. Hey, at least they can still hire a company like mine and, and 
have a consultation where they can call in, you know, so it definitely makes a difference. Definitely. So, um, able to do that at, at, for Speedway Motorsports Incorporated. It's, um, it definitely, I tell them, I'll worry about the weather. You guys worry about running the event. And, and it's just, I think it's a peace of mind for those folks. Well, I mean, I, I say it all, all the time myself is, uh, I'll tell you when you need to worry. Yeah. You know. I'll do the worrying <laughs> for you. <laughs> exactly. I'll tell you when you need to worry. So, yeah. Um, I want to get back to what you mentioned about winds, right? So we, we talked yeah. about wind science, right? And we get into the nitty gritty of it, right? So you're talking about sea breezes, you're talking about things at the coastline, even inland, where you can have uh, wind shifting or building, you know, stronger pressure gradient, higher winds from certain directions. Do you get into the science of saying, you look at the course, you look at the direction of wind, the dominant direction of wind for the day, and the speeds, do you talk about which links are going to be more difficult than others when you look at long range trajectory shots or higher iron shots, you know, do you, do you speak about look for a lean to the left or hooking or anything like that when you get into the wind forecast? Yeah. Um, you know, the rules officials, the, the guys that are setting up the golf course, they're the ones that's more concerned with which holes are going to play. Um, let's, let's just say we have on hole number one, we have a strong South wind and it's blowing, you know, 15 to 20 miles per hour. Well, if it's blowing from behind them, then a lot of times what, what they'll do is they'll move the tee blocks back so that hole plays longer. And then on the next hole, maybe it's going the opposite direction. Now it's in the player's face when they tee off. So they may move those tee blocks up so it plays shorter. That way they're, they're trying to keep everything moving, but they're also trying to make it not hard, but they're trying to make it fair too. You know, not necessarily hard, but fair and keep things moving. So, you know, crosswinds play a big, big role, um, especially near the greens where if there's a lake or a big, big uh, sand trap or something that's on the right side and it's growing from left to right, well, they may put that whole location more towards the left side of the green. So guys aren't dumping in the lake the whole time, time trying to get it to the hole. That's, you know, so all those strategies play a role in how the golf course is set up. So definitely wind direction def definitely is important, how strong oh, the wind is. So they're actually changing distances and, and layout. Abs absolutely. So we have 18 holes. You know, we have 18 holes, and all through that golf course, it's going to be in their face or behind them, left to right, right to left. You know, so all those things play a role in how the golf course is set up. So definitely uh, wind definitely is a major impact on, on golf tournaments. So. Very interesting. Very neat. Scotty, go ahead. Yeah, Stuart, um, in, in some circumstances, I know we saw the Masters um, had some severe weather roll through back in 2019. Uh, when we see these big severe weather events, you guys, I'm sure, coordinate with, with the course, with the tour, with the TV networks, and kind of make the best plans. Is that is that right? Yeah, you know, um, we try to do what's right. Um, you know, you, you don't want to get anybody hurt. And if there's a high risk for severe weather, i.e. tornadoes or even, you know, just strong straight line wind and storms, you know, there's a, we may go early, two tees early on the weekend or, or a day on the weekend to avoid some of that severe weather that we think is going to happen in the afternoon. So, you know, the tour is aware of that and they'll try to make accommodations to maybe avoid some of that to keep people safe and, and get the round in. Because you know, you know the the tour has a policy that we'll play on Monday to complete 72 holes. 72 holes is a must. They want they want to get every round in. So um, you know, so we will do that on Sundays a lot of time to try to get everything completed and and uh, so we don't have to go into Monday. But for the most part, you know, if it's a 30 40 percent chance of a thunderstorm day, then they're not likely going to change anything. It's just going to we're going to play golf and, and hopefully, you know, that scattered thunderstorm will stay away from us. But if we do get hit and we don't finish, well, we'll be back Monday morning. So that's how it works. I know another element that, that, that is tricky for you guys, especially on the West Coast, on the West Coast swing early in the season is fog. Wow. Uh, seeing lots of uh, fog and even – uh, some cancellations of around because of visibility. Talk to us a little bit about forecasting fog. Yeah, it's tough, man. It, uh, that marine layer out there in, in 
and what, what, what most people don't realize in California, the, uh, the Pacific Ocean out there gets the Aleutian Current, which is very cold. It's cold water. And so fog forms on it quite a bit. Um, so when we get out there, a lot of the things that we look for is the offshore flow. And we love it when there's offshore flow because it, it pushes that marine layer out and way out in the ocean and skies stay clear at the golf course. Well, the thing that I've learned forecasting the weather out there, as soon as that pressure gradient starts going neutral, that's usually when the marine layer fog will move in. And so I've seen it. We had it, uh, we had it uh, this year at Torrey Pines at the Farmers and Cheers Open. One day the, the fog rolled in early in the morning and it stuck around till about 9, 9.30 in the morning. So we had to delay for a couple hours and then it, the sun finally ate through it and broke it apart and it pushed offshore. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough thing because um, with fog, you just don't know how long it's going to stick around, you know, Especially how thick it's going to be. We get the marine layer out there too. A lot of, sometimes it lifts and it's just a cloud deck and you're fine. It's just a cloudy day. But um, at Torrey Pines, we do have some elevation. I think we're up at four or 500 feet there. And um, so if it lifts up to five, 500 feet, we're in, we're in the cloud and we get socked in. And then obviously you go other places along the coast there that's not elevated and it's fine. So it's definitely tough, um, but uh, it's something we deal with and we just try to help the best we can with that. So uh, I know we're getting uh, late on the interview. Um, a fun question here. Any, uh, any favorite PGA tour stops and, any uh, any of the PGA Tour players uh, really weather savvy that we uh, that we might not know about? Uh, well, I mean, favorite weather stops. I mean, as far as uh, any tournaments go, Hilton Head's a big favorite of mine. Any Hawaii tournament's great. Um, Pebble Beach is awesome if the weather's good. Same thing with Torrey Pines in California. So yeah, we do. We go to some great places. I mean, this past year I went to Japan and South Korea. I went to Shanghai, China. And uh, this year, later in the year, I'm going to Australia. So, yeah, I mean, we go to some great places, and it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, it's, wow. it's good. I was going to say, you, you have to go to these areas and actually learn the weather in these areas. You probably would have to understand it before you even go. Yeah, you know, um, believe it or not, I mean, everywhere I go, I start paying attention to where I'm going a month or two ahead of time. So I know when I get there what's been happening. So you kind of got a feel for what's been going on. So, you know, I've already been keeping tabs for the next couple of weeks when I go to Tucson and California again. And, uh, you know, and then obviously long-term you kind of looking, you know, I've got the, I've got uh, Florida lurking in March. I'm going down to Florida. So you definitely keep up with what's going on and what's been happening. So, you know, kind of what to expect going into it. So, it's definitely harder in Japan and Korea and some of these places where, you know, maybe the radar data is not as timely or you don't have all the good data you have here in the U.S. You still have some data, but maybe not quite as good as some of the things you're used to using. So, and, um, you know, forecasting wind and things like that gets a little more difficult in some of these spots. So, you know, but still us being there is still better than not, you know, for the tour and some of these tournaments, having us there is still better than not having us there where they would just be guessing. So, you know, we do the best we can and they know it's, uh, it's not the U S and it's not quite as good, but it's still, we, we still, we still send our electric field mill over there and, you know, we still have that and the detection network and that kind of thing. So. Oh, wow. I bet that's interesting. Transporting that equipment across seas to a foreign country. <laughs> Um, well, um, yeah, the, the tour sends a lot of containers and things. So, uh, you know, it goes on with a lot of the scoreboards and that kind of stuff. So it, uh, it helps. One more question for me is as yeah. far as the golf and the weather. We talk about course saturation. We're talking about frost in the morning, dew on the grass, um, you know, dew points, humidity, right? Um, yep. How does it factor in to your forecast for when – the starting time is does does that sometimes get pumped up because of the ground's just wet and needs time to dry out or well um you know obviously uh 
you know, if it's totally saturated, um, there's the rules of golf dictate what we can do as far as playing golf on a saturated golf course. So if there's still some standing water or some real wet areas, um, the tour a lot of time will institute a policy of lift clean in place where they can get relief maybe from some of those spots to a drier area that's not not any closer to the hole, but they get some relief. And then they can pick up mud on their ball so they can pick the ball up and wipe the mud off and place it back down and then hit it. So that, that helps us out quite a bit. But if we still have water running down the fairways or there's puddles on the greens and you can't put the ball through a puddle, so then obviously we can't play in those in those conditions. But, you know, golf courses are made to drain. So, you know, typically once the standing water is gone, then they institute that policy, maybe lift clean in place. That way we can still play and uh, not be stopped under the rules of golf. So um, as far as frost goes, we do try to do for frost forecast. It does come into play a lot of times when we're in the desert of Arizona um, in February and March it can get really cold there in the mornings and then and then warm up pretty quickly for the for the mid to late morning so um we try to help them out with fr frost forecast obviously you got to just wait for it to melt before you can get on there because you don't want to kill the grass stepping on it so usually frost delays are not that long they're usually 30 minutes to an hour and then we can get out there and play um, as far as uh, late in the year a lot of places where we go is Florida and, and uh, the Southeast and that kind of thing. So typically we don't deal with frost too much in the fall, but definitely early in the year. Well, Stuart, thank you so much uh, for joining us. We uh, certainly appreciate it and glad that we could catch you while you're here at home. And uh, we wish you the best of luck as you uh, travel out to all these cool destinations and hopefully uh, you'll have some good weather. If folks want to follow along, do you have a social media account or something you'd like to promote? Yeah, I um, um You can follow me on Twitter. It's at P-G-A-W-X-M-A-N and the number one. So it's P-G-A-W-X-Man1 on Twitter. And I'm on uh, Facebook, just Stuart Williams. You'll just have to find me on that. But uh, that's the only two social medias that I'm on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Twitter, definitely follow me. And you can see what the forecasts are, what's going on at these tournaments that we're doing and these other events. So. Uh, and the weather's bad and you're at that tournament, just go find Stuart. <laughs> you, you can blame him for, for it. Yeah, that's but, right. Uh, <laughs> Stuart, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, as always, we uh, appreciate your time and uh, glad to catch up with you and I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. Scotty, thanks. Thank you guys for having me on. I uh, appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun and hopefully we can do it more often. Yes, sir. All right, guys. Thanks for watching the Carolina Weather Group. We'll see you back for another episode next week all right and that is our interview with stuart williams dtn meteorologist who uh, goes to all the pga tour events and provides them on location weather support that interview again was recorded in february for what we thought was going to coincide uh, with a premiere for the wells fargo championship in charlotte uh, this week the pga tour is back in action they are at the rbc heritage event in hilton head south carolina and we followed up with stewart who a did tell us that he is still going to the event fans and spectators aren't but he will still be there to support the event and he has sent us a look at their forecast so here it is uh stewart's notes the upper level low pressure system of the carolinas will continue to lift north away from the area this will allow the summer heat and humidity and higher instability to return friday into saturday upper level energy will combine with the afternoon sea breeze to produce the chance for showers and thunderstorms during the afternoon hours the chance for any showers or thunderstorm activity will decrease sunday into monday as high pressure briefly builds over the south east so uh stewart thank you very much uh, for a look at your forecast there and of course stewart will be continuing to track the forecast and as he mentioned in our tape you can find him on twitter at pgawxman1 if i got that right and uh, he is putting out the forecast each morning as he has done for the practice rounds so if you want to stay up to date with everything there on hilton head south carolina you can uh, follow him for 
that. Uh, so we are happy to know that uh, they'll be able to get some uh, play in. Uh, we're still watching this cutoff low. I've just been watching this on a loop. It's just mesmerizing. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will get out of here before too long, too. Matter of fact, I think by the time we're looking at Father's Day here uh, on Sunday in Charlotte is when we can expect the last of a lot of these clouds to, uh, to move on out. Uh, the other thing we were watching uh, earlier in the week was the possible development of what could have been a tropical cyclone off the Georgia coast. It had about a 10% chance of development. Well, you can see now in the latest outlook from the National Hurricane Center, no tropical cyclone activity expected during the next 48 hours. Uh, that is uh, certainly some good news, a reminder that we are in the uh, hurricane season. And uh, the next name will be Dolly. We've already had four named cyclones uh, in the uh, the Atlantic Basin this year, so the next one will be Dolly. Speaking of hurricanes, our friend uh, Grant Gilmore in Tampa, his station WTSP, reporting this week that the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center facility, which houses the hurricane hunters, they're in Lakeland, Florida, confirming five employees have tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, their aircraft, as you know, flies into Hurricane to gather uh, information that we can't otherwise get. So uh, although we have the NOAA aircraft, there's an Air Force reconnaissance plane as well, too, uh, that does provide some redundancy. Uh, they are dealing now with at least five cases of coronavirus there at their Florida facility. And so well, with nothing happening in the tropical basin, uh, that is certainly good news. Uh, one uh, weather headline, one last weather headline for you from the Washington Post. Uh, we had a, a development in what has become known as the Sharp gate scandal. Uh, this goes back to Hurricane Dorian, the uh, investigation concluding this week. Investigation following the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, which of course you know is NOAA, found that the agency leadership violated its scientific integrity policy through actions that led to the release of a statement that backed President Trump's false statements about the path of Hurricane Dorian. This is uh, from the Washington Post. That NOAA statement, which you may recall came out in September of 2019, contradicted forecasters at NOAA's own National Weather Service in Birmingham, Alabama. You probably recall the iconic photo of the president in the overall office giving a briefing, forecast cone, and drawing on to extend the forecast cone into Alabama using a Sharpie, hence the name Sharpie Gate. So uh, we had that development out this week. Uh, we are uh, working on all new episode again for you next week on the Carolina Weather Group. Uh, if you haven't already, we encourage you to subscribe to our audio podcast. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcast. And uh, we hope you get a chance to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate all of that feedback. So whether you're watching tonight on Facebook or YouTube or Twitch or Periscope or listening to the audio podcast while you're getting some chores done around the house, uh, we do appreciate you staying with us and hanging out with us this week on the Carolina a weather group uh, from Charlotte. I am James Briarton. We will see you back here next week. We uh, will leave you. I'm hoping I'm trying to pull up a camera in Hilton Head, South Carolina uh, to take a look at conditions there right now. Ah, it's not coming up. Go figure. But uh, you'll have to trust us uh, that Stewart's forecast says it won't be uh, all too shabby. And here it is. Uh, a look uh, from the uh, salty dog there in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Again, I'm James Briarton, Charlotte. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.